Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Skaberg here with Consolidated Planning Group. We are happy and excited to be back uh, with Christina Lesher, the Law Office of Christina Lesher. We've done uh, several webinars with Christina in the past, and um, it's always a pleasure to uh, be working with her again. So um, I always like to go over a few housekeeping items uh, before we get started. So today's webinar is being recorded. Um, everyone who has registered for today's webinar is going to get a copy of today's slides and a link to the recording so you don't have to take notes on everything uh, that you hear today. You are going to get the slides. Um, we are in webinar mode today, and I do re realize that sometimes people are listening to us um, on podcast. Um, so in webinar mode, we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're there, and we invite you to put your questions today in the chat box. We're going to be getting to as many questions as we can during the time that we have together today. Um, if you're planning your um, your your time, um, we'll be going for an hour or less um, uh, as we go through this stuff. One of the things that I want to mention, though, is that, um, you know, Christina's going to be talking about the five special needs documents, the top five special needs documents. And what I will tell you is everything that we're going to talk about today can have its its own one hour webinar. So, um, you know, we're going to hit the highlights and kind of, um, you know, scratch the surface on, on things. But we have taken a deeper dive on all of these topics and they do live on our YouTube channel. So if you're listening to us um, by podcast and you would like a copy of today's slides, you can reach out to us at contact at cpgcares.net. That's contact at cpgcares.net. And we'll be happy to um, provide you a copy of the slides. Um, all of our past webinars live on that YouTube channel. The Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel was born out of my own frustration. I am a parent uh, to adult kids with special needs. And what I would say is when it comes to planning for them and making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and that we don't do anything wrong to mess up any of the benefits and things like that, it's it's tough. It, it, it is hard. And I eat, sleep, and breathe this, but our um, the webinars that we do, um, it's our way of giving back to the community um, by way of advocacy um, to help you and empower you as you're embarking on this journey with your loved one um, to feel like you have the tools and the resources that you need to be successful. Consolidated Planning Group, um, we are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We're nationally certified as social security advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Our whole firm is nuanced in working with families who have a loved one with a disability who may or may not have care needs for the rest of their life. Um, careful planning goes into, um, in, into play when it comes to planning for our loved ones. And Christina is going to be talking about this a lot today. Um, a lot of that careful planning on what we're referring to is because we want to preserve the eligibility for state and federally funded programs, such things as SSI and Medicaid. There's other programs as well, Medicaid waivers, and you may have heard of those, and we have entire topics uh, dedicated to that. But we help people put protection plans in place. We help answer questions like, who's going to care for my child when I'm gone or I no longer can? How much money do I need to fund the special needs trust? We help people set up ABLE accounts, do a lot of transition planning. And Christina, as you already know, um, a lot of people get confused on what you do and what we do. And I always, you know, simplify that by saying that you're the paper, the legal documents, um, the law, and we're the money. And so while we don't do what Christina and her firm do, she doesn't really do uh, what we do either. And, and we, Christina and I have talked about this at length, and we really believe that it's really, really important that you work with a specialist. Your situation is specialized, and you do want to work with a professional that is nuanced in these state and federally funded programs to preserve that eligibility because a lot of times what we see and we see this kind of thing all the time people have accidentally disqualified themselves um, for things that they shouldn't have so it, it, that is really really important um christina uh, tell us a little bit about your firm and um and kind of where you're located and thank you again for being here with us today Oh, uh, Allison, it's great to see you again and to be back again. So um, my practice began uh, 
as really as a frustrated social worker. So I have a degree in social work and I went to U of H law and this is my 21st year practicing law. Uh, my law firm consists of myself and my care manager slash brother, whose name is Robert Pierce. And Robert had worked in the disability community on the residential side for years. Um, and then I also have a Medicaid caseworker that I um, had transitioned over from Health and Human Services. And now, like Charlie's Angel, she works for me. So um, we are very passionate just as uh, you are, Allison, at Consolidated Planning about maintaining public benefits, really giving parents, loved ones, caregivers peace of mind that what they're doing today is going to provide that transition plan for their child later on. Okay, so we're going to start with our top five special needs documents here. Um, anybody that's over the age of 18 is going to need these documents. So we've got a will um, or a trust. And do you need a will or trust or both is going to be a very individualized decision and you need good legal counsel uh, to assist you with that. Uh, third party trust, first party trust. We're going to go over both of these different types of trust in some detail here in a little bit and documents for incapacity. Um, I've got clients that come in and we usually want to start talking about dying, which is part of life. But one of the things we also have to do is think about the documents that need to be put in place in case of our incapacity or illness for financial and medical decisions and also for um, our minor children um, and end of life issues as well. And then Allison and I spend a lot of time talking about beneficiary designations. If you don't take anything away from this talk, one, one thing I, the, the thing I want you to take away that's so important is a beneficiary designation is going to trump whatever legal instrument you have. So if you have a special needs child or loved one and you've named them in their individual capacity on a bank account, that is probably going to be a mistake and you're going to want to correct that. So we'll talk about that more later as we go through our presentation today. All right, next slide. Okay, so we talked about will or revocable trust or both. They both do the same thing, which is they transfer assets at your death to the people or, or entities that you want to have your money, your assets. Um, we have a little note up there about probate, estate versus non-probate assets. So this is very important, especially when we're thinking about beneficiary designations. Life insurance, retirement accounts, those are typically non-probate accounts because you've named the people, you've done the paperwork with that financial institution on who's going to receive that asset at your death. The house is frequently a probate asset, meaning you have to have a will, which is a written document, effective at your death to say where you want those assets that are controlled by the will to go. And yes, you do have to go through the probate process to make a will effective. So just having a will is not enough just to transfer title or ownership over a piece of property at your death. Uh, we see this misconception in my office all the time where a, a couple has been married for a long time. The husband dies first, has a will. They never go through probate because they think it just goes automatically. And that doesn't, that's not the case at all. The will can also contain a guardianship appointments on who will take care of your child or children at your death. It can have a supplemental needs trust. A supplemental needs trust is a, is a type of legal instrument that you can leave assets in, and it will not be counted for the purposes of Medicaid eligibility. As you may know, Medicaid says you can only have a certain amount of assets that are what we call countable, and in most situations, that countable asset limitation is $2,000. However, if you have plans put together and you leave assets or your money or the things that belong to you in a supplemental needs trust that's drafted correctly, then that's not going to be looked at as a countable asset to that child or, or, or family member who is needing um, to qualify for Medicaid benefits. The will can also have a trust for um, children or individuals that are minors. I have two minor sons. So in my will, I have something that's called a descendants trust so that they don't get the money outright. Um, they get the money when they turn 25 and I may increase that age depending on how things go the next few years. So the will effective at your death, a revocable trust, 
I compare it to having like a, a bowl of soup and we can put things in that cereal bowl or that bowl of soup now because it's effective now. And it can contain a lot of the same provisions that the will does, the supplemental needs trust, the trust for the child that's a minor. Um, so we typically do not put things like IRAs or life insurance into the revocable trust, but we do update the beneficiary designation. So at your death, um, the provisions, typically a supplemental needs trust will be the owner of those assets for your children. And with a revocable trust, you still have to have a will. We do something that's called a pour over will, which says if you have anything in your probate estate, it's going to automatically pour over into that revocable trust that you've created. Um, and then those terms would apply. So I like revocable trusts with supplemental needs trust for families with special needs, primarily because I don't want that child to have to wait to go through the probate process. Even though in Texas, they've done a lot better job eliminating a lot of the requirements. I like things that are effective immediately. So the family members that are going to be taking care of your um, child's money at your death have immediate access. It's a faster process and a faster transition. Um, and that last bullet point, Allison, we cannot, we cannot uh, underscore enough or underscore or emphasize enough the need to make sure your beneficiary designations are updated. Because if it's not updated, then it could go to your child and cause an eligibility problem. And not only do you need to check your beneficiary designations, you need to make sure that you communicate to other family members that they haven't left your child in their individual capacity on a CD. Typically what we see are things like it's enough money to be a problem, but not enough money to fix problems. So um, we'll talk about how one option for fixing a problem as someone receives money outright and not in a trust here in just a little bit. So, Christina, you said um, a lot on the slide. There's a lot of information and all um, very good. And I, I can't agree with you more that I like the standalone special needs trust that's already established as opposed to somebody dies. There's a crisis. Somebody has deceased, you know, is deceased. And now we're trying to, you know, do the trust because people have needs immediately, right? Not the time that it takes to get the trust set up. So I do um, agree with that. And I also wanted to mention that um, all trusts, there are a lot of different trusts out there and all trusts are not created equally. And it is important for a person to understand that it's not a, a quote unquote trust that if it's a, if the money's in a trust, then it won't be counted against them. There is a specific type of trust and Christina is going to go deeper on that, that it has to be the money has to be slated to for your loved one with a disability for it not to be counted. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's very important. And then I just want to reiterate what you said. I know we probably beat this, you know, to death on the beneficiaries, but it is true that a lot of people, they get their legal documents done, they do their wills and they do their trust. And then you ask about beneficiaries and they say, oh, we've got that all taken care of. We worked with a, a, a lawyer. We've got that all taken care of. And then you ask, well, did you change? Did you update your beneficiaries on your 401k, 403b, pension, life insurance, old things that you had from the past? And the answer is no, because a lot of times people didn't know that they needed mm -hmm. to do that. And so mm -hmm. it is so critically important to, to understand that that really is a thing. And and we've seen bad things happen where like beneficiary designations didn't get changed after a divorce and mm -hmm. the ex is the beneficiary or yeah, so definitely all, don't want that to happen. Yeah. We've seen all kinds of crazy stuff happen yeah. over the years. Yeah. So if you're taking notes, I think that the big thing is, you know, make a list of those assets that you do have. Some might be with your employer, they might be with an old employer. Um, they, you know, they may be bank accounts or like we said, life insurance or things like that, that have a benefit. It could even be a cancer plan that has a benefit, right? Um, so check your beneficiaries. And the cool thing is, um, what I would say is what a lot of people do is that they make their spouses the beneficiary if you're married. And then they say, um, if I die and my spouse is dead and gone, then that's easy. I'm just going to name my kids equally. Okay, and so if you've done that, you're not alone. A lot of people do that and it's it's easily fixed, right? So all you have to do is request a change of beneficiary form. That is a free request. 
It is free to submit that. You don't have to hire me or Christina to do that. You can get those change of beneficiary forms. We don't want to name little Johnny directly as a beneficiary on anything you have. We would want to name his special needs trust for the benefit of Johnny is how we do it the right way. And, um, and to Christina's point, the thing is, is um, when you were talking, Christina, about, you know, it's enough to cause a problem, but not enough to, to solve the problems. That is so true because the limits are so low for Medicaid for the state of Texas. Now, other states are different. Most states are $2,000. Um, the state of California raised it up to over 100, I think it's $125,000. They've raised it up like significantly but most states are $2,000. So one little bitty bank account that was accidentally left, one little CD, those little things can really make the difference. So let's see if we have uh, any question. Um, we Is a revocable trust, is that the same as a special needs trust? Um, no, a revocable trust is, I would think of it as the, the instrument that would hold a supplemental needs trust. So, um, one way to envision it is think of the supplemental needs trust to be a special trust that would be within the body of the revocable trust. And the revocable trust works well because you can put assets in it during your lifetime and whoever your trustee is can manage it during a period of incapacity. And then at your death, it would transfer to this supplemental needs trust that's already within the revocable trust document. So I, ho I hope that makes sense to whoever asked that question. It's a good question. Um, I have one other thing. One thing that you said is that Texas has done a much better job, you know, as far as administering estates and things like that. And I've actually heard that before. And and I've actually even heard some counsel say that you might not even need a trust uh, in the, the, the state of Texas. And I'm kind of a fan of having one. Um, can you tell us that even if probate is easy in Texas, the benefits of having a trust versus not having one? Yeah, so during your lifetime, the revocable trust can hold assets that your trustee that you select can manage for you. And the revocable trust in many instances is easier to use and be, and have other financial institutions um, review and accept it than a financial power of attorney. You know, I had a case a few years ago, we had a, a financial power of attorney. And of course, the client had 12 different bank accounts and getting 12 different financial institutions to approve a legal document was very difficult, but if it had been funded into a trust, it would have been a lot easier. Um, so that's the benefit of having a trust is it's easier for financial management during your lifetime. And then at death, you don't have to go through that probate process, which means that your child would be able to access money and their supplemental needs trust a whole lot faster. And that's what you, that's the peace of mind you wanna give your family. So why do we need supplemental needs trust? Because there are a way that you can leave assets to a loved one who is on Medicaid that's not going to disqualify them for their, their benefits. Um, there's over 109 different Medicaid programs in the state of Texas, which makes it so difficult for families to be able to navigate this system. And each program has their own income, asset, transfer policy, which means if you give away assets, um, you could lose eligibility and different uh, disability requirements. So like we said, a supplemental needs trust allows you to leave assets into a legal instrument so that those assets don't count against that, in, in most cases, $2,000 asset cap. So for those who aren't familiar about how Medicaid looks at assets, when you apply for Medicaid for you or a loved one, uh, Medicaid's going to divide those assets into two categories, countable assets, that's going to be cash, bank account, second car, second home, um, and then exempt, which is going to be worth zero dollars, and that's typically a homestead, personal item, clothing, um, and in some long-term care programs, even a retirement account can be an exempt asset. And then as we stated, most Medicaid programs say, if you have more than $2,000 in your name, you will lose eligibility. So that's why we put money into a supplemental needs trust for that child or loved one that's going to be needing that Medicaid. And why do we create, a, a, why do we need assets in a trust for a person with a disability, 
because we all know that Medicaid is not going to pay for everything that that child is going to need. So I have a disabled nephew, his name is James, he's almost 14, and he's on a program called MDCP for Medically Dependent Children. And while his Medicaid program pays for a lot of his needs, it's not going to pay for everything for him. So we've done some planning for him so that uh, at my death, James will get money into a supplemental needs trust to help cover those expenses that Medicaid will not pay for. It also allows for the money to be protected from what we call bad actors. A lot of times families will say, I don't want to set up a trust. I just want to be able to leave money to his sister and then hopefully she'll she'll take care of it for him. And that's and that that may work out for that particular family, but there's always a risk. What happens if that particular family member who's holding the money not in trust gets divorced, gets sued, passes away, and then that money goes to their family and not to the person that it was intended to. So that's why a supplemental needs trust um, may be a helpful um, uh, legal instrument. And I see we've got a bunch of questions, Allison. I'm going to let you pick which ones you want to go through. Yeah, um, we'll I'll, we'll run through on both. Um, so do you have to be on Medicaid to get a waiver? And the answer is yes. The waivers, all states have waivers. So if you're listening from out of state, all state have waivers. They are Medicaid waivers, and what they are for is they are designed to waive off some of the cost of care of caring for an individual with a disability to keep them in home and community-based services and out of being institutionalized is the point of them. They pay for various therapies. Some of them pay for housing. They, um, they pay for a variety of different things. It could be modifications. There's a lot of different waivers. But if you want your child to be eligible for a waiver in the future, the waiting list is very long in Texas, 17 plus years, um, you got to be Medicaid qualified. So that is a thing. And now the other thing I want to mention to you is when we have kids that are minors, the Medicaid qualifications, as Christina mentioned, there's like 109 programs. The Medicaid qualifications for the waivers is based off of the kids income and assets, not the parent. So even if the kid's a minor and they come up on the list, they can, you know, qualify should they not have assets in their name. It's not the parent's assets. Right. right. Um, so that's one reason. That's one big reason. And I want to just pause on that just for a second, because, you know, we work with a lot of people and to say, you know, we've got plenty of money in the special needs trust and we're not worried about running out of money. Why do we care about Medicaid? Do we even need Medicaid? My child's covered by group health insurance. They're also covered by Medicare. Do I care um, about Medicaid? And I think that the answer is a very personal answer on whether or not you care or not about it. But what I will say is depending on the level of need of the individual, um, these Medicaid waivers, um, depending on which one it is, their budgets can be substantial, you know, on the low end, 40, 50 grand a year, all the way up to $340,000 a year on some of these waivers. Um, so I would argue that, yes, that would help defray some of the costs and expenses of the person. So, I mean, if you say, uh, seriously, we've got $20 million in our trust, then maybe you could say, I could care less about the Medicaid waiver and I don't want to deal with the headache with health and human services and things like that. And that is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. um, the next question um, for you, um, Christina, is um, if assets are left in a special needs trust, is the one donating to the special needs trust having to claim that as a gift and pay the gift tax? So I'm gonna, I hate to say it, but it, the lawyerly answer is it depends. It has to be what we call a completed gift. So as mom and dad, if you are both the grantor and the trustee and you make a gift um, of the annual gift tax exclusion amount, because you have control over that, you still have control over that asset, it's not a completed gift. And it depends on how much you're going to be transferring. You know, a lot of people will fund these supplemental needs trusts with assets, um, and it may not be considered a completed gift, but it doesn't matter because they don't have a taxable estate. Um, you know, with our taxable estate number so high, uh, I think it's like over 20 million right now, most of my clients are not worried about the gift tax issues. If, if you are, then you may need to change the grantor, you may need to change the trustee. And I think the concern, I think it's 12.6 per person. So that's where it would be over 20. 
and the concern is is that if they do nothing it's going back down big time mm -hmm. uh 2026 mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. it hasn't been announced yet so there is some concern for some people that if it goes back mm -hmm. down um significantly mm -hmm. that they may have some big tax issues we do have a cpa that we refer to on yeah. a regular yeah. basis that is nuanced and special needs trust we've done webinars with her before and um that will be on our youtube channel so you can check that out she's done like taxation and special needs trust. So that may be um, one that you want to check out. Good advice. So a third party supplemental needs trust, this can be put into a revocable trust or in a will or as a, a separate document. And it's funded with assets that do not belong to the Medicaid beneficiary to the child. Um, there's no payback to the state of Texas. Um, and the trustee can be any person or entity other than the Medicaid beneficiary. So you cannot be the trustee of your own trust. Um, and then you can name who the beneficiaries are after the death of the um, uh, child. Um, and these trusts are typically reviewed with less scrutiny than those that are what we call first party supplemental needs trust. And those are trusts that are funded with the Medicaid beneficiary's own assets. Okay. So Allison, nothing more on the third party trust that you wanted me to add? Let's just talk about some of the differences. Um, because I think a lot of times, you know, we just do this all the time and we just throw around the first party and the third party and, you know, someone will call and say, I need a first party. And sometimes they do most of the time they need a third party are, are there, you know, kind of confused on the differences. So let's, let's, take a deeper dive on the differences between them. Sure. So how, a better way for me maybe to explain it is where the money comes from depends on what type of trust that we uh, place uh, the money into. Um, so if the money comes directly from grandma to the trust, it can go into a supplemental needs trust. But if grandma had left uh, Johnny as a beneficiary on a bank account, then that money has to go into a first party supplemental needs trust. And it's these first party supplemental needs trusts that are reviewed with a lot of scrutiny and have to have certain requirements. The first one is the person that's establishing the trust known as the grantor has to be a parent, grandparent, guardian, or court order, or under the SNT Fairness Act of 2016, the Medicaid beneficiary can also be his or her own grantor. The trustee can be any person or entity other than the beneficiary and the beneficiary's funds, meaning the individual who's on Medicaid, those are, are their funds are used to um, establish the trust. Um, you can also use these first party trusts if you've got child support that's causing someone to be over the income cap for SSI. And distributions have to be made for the sole benefit of the child. That means that the money that comes out cannot be used for anybody else other than that child. And the assets have to be placed into the trust before the 65th birthday. Now, some states are different. I believe Florida, you can fund these types of trusts after the age of 65, but in Texas, it has to be funded before the age of 65. Now, after the age of 65, the trust money can come back out and just can't go in before 65 without a loss of eligibility for benefits. And at the death of the beneficiary, there has to be a repayment to the state or states that paid for that Medicaid beneficiary's um, care. So this is a good point to show and illustrate that this type of special needs practice is not a cookie cutter form based practice. I see a lot of trusts that are third party trusts, meaning they were funded with grandma's money directly to the trust. And there's a payback provision in there unnecessarily. Or I just saw a first party trust where it said at when the trust terminates, all the money goes back to the state of Texas. Well, it can't say that. It has to go say to the state or states. It can't be state specific. Um, and then on this first party trust, um, you can name backup beneficiaries. I just saw a question that says, yeah, can you use the first party trust for housing? Yes, if the trust allows for it. 
we look at some trusts that were drafted or maybe are floating around the internet and it will say that this trust cannot be used for food, clothing, or shelter. And that is unduly restrictive. Um, you can use first party and third party trust funds to pay for food, clothing, and shelter. Um, you, If you're on SSI, you will have a reduction of your SSI payment. But if the trust allows for those distributions, then yes, you can use them. And I'm glad whoever put that question in the chat box did so, because it's another problem that I see or what I call troublesome trusts where they're too restrictive. There's no reason for a trust to say that you cannot make a, a distribution for housing because you absolutely can. Um, this is this again could be a whole topic in and of itself, as Allison said, all of these slides could be another hour uh, presentation. But the short answer is yes, these trusts if they allow for the trust language allows for it, they can pay for housing. Um, the only thing I want to comment on you mentioned, and I just want to say it again, because this is a big, big, big issue. Um, in a lot of states, Texas is one of them where oftentimes, not always, child support continues post age 18, sometimes as long as the kid is in school, sometimes indefinitely because the kid has a disability. and. I cannot stress enough the importance of that child support being redirected to a first party special needs trust. It is so very, very important and um, tell people. So I think it's important to have those conversations if divorce is on the horizon or you're in the throes of that to have these conversations on the front end and get it set up properly on the front end, not waiting until they're 18 and realizing you have a problem. Yeah. Um, talk talk a little bit more about that because I think there's a lot of confusion on on how that works and and why on earth would the Social Security Administration count child support against the child when they're paying the mom or the dad or they whoever. do like, they do count it as a income stream to that child and if the child support is too much then that child will have no SSI income and without SSI income we lose Medicaid eligibility now, I like the idea that Allison says that if we're in a divorce situation, we set up this uh, first party trust um, prior to the child turning 18. Sometimes based on the nature of the case, we're just simply not able to do that. So what happens is the child support is directed by court order into the first party supplemental needs trust. It has to have all these provisions that are listed. And if that's done, and if it's done correctly, then social security will not look at or count child support as income to that child so that they will receive their SSI and then therefore receive their Medicaid benefits, which is the, really the main benefit of that program. One key thing you said is by court order, and I, I want to reiterate that because I've heard people say, well, I just opened up a special needs trust account and I just changed it. Um, there There is a requirement for a court order for that, for it to be considered a legitimate move. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So now we're going to talk about documents for incapacity for you uh, and maybe for your child. So even if you're married, if you've been married a very long time, you still need a financial power of attorney. And if you have a financial power of attorney, good. One thing I want you to do is send it to your financial institutions for their pre-approval, especially for IRAs. Just because you've named your spouse as a beneficiary on an IRA, that doesn't mean that they have management capabilities during um, your lifetime. So if you become incapacitated and are ill uh, and you can't manage that account or you need to take out some money from that IRA or retirement account, you definitely want to have that financial power of attorney on file. Um, and I like to do the financial power of attorney two ways. I like to do a general one that I prepare here in my office for my clients. And then if the financial institutions have their own uh, power of attorney, go ahead and fill that one out too. Um, financial powers of attorney, I like them to be effective immediately so they're easier to use. Um, I had a client say, well, I don't want someone to use my power of attorney if, if I'm able to handle my assets because I, you know, I don't know if I trust them. Uh, well, if you don't trust that person and they definitely don't need to be on the document, um, then we have a medical power of attorney that is effective when you can no longer make a medical decision for yourself, a HIPAA release. This is a group of people that can have access to your medical information. It's typically effective immediately. Um, you can terminate it after a certain period of time, 
or you can have it last for two years after your date of death. Uh, and, and I would suggest anybody that has your financial power of attorney also needs to have your HIPAA release so that they have access to your medical information if they need to um, speak to an insurance company. A directive to physicians, this is an end of life document. It will say what kind of care you want in case of a terminal or an irreversible condition. And that means that your life expectancy is, is, is supposed to be less than six months. What do you wanna have done? And then also a do not resuscitate, which is different than a directive to physicians and do not resuscitate uh, means that you uh, have requested or your family has requested or your agent under your medical power of attorney has requested that no resuscitation be given to you. Uh, if you have minor children like I do, I have an appointment for healthcare for both of my boys so that if I'm out of town, um, my brother, their uncle can make a, a, a medical decision for them if he's taking care of them. Uh, and then sometimes families will want some type of uh, uh, what we call post-mortem or after death um, instructions for how, what happens to their body or what kind of funeral. That's the appointment for designation of remains um, and maybe for medical study or organ donation. So we we're talking about all these documents in the context of the parents, but if your child is able and has capacity to sign these documents, uh, maybe we go ahead and get them executed for that child uh, and avoid guardianship, which I know that slide's coming up, Allison, but these all these documents can avoid guardianship for you as well, which is a very expensive and timely court proceeding where a judge comes in and says, okay, you can't make a financial or medical decision for yourself. Um, it's a legal process, which means we have more than two lawyers in the room. Anytime we have more than two lawyers in the room, things get very expensive. Um, so we want to avoid guardianship if we can, but we're using these documents. And then um, if your child is able to sign these documents um, and understand what the documents are, he or she may want to sign these as well. I just like to add that um, as you're thinking about this for yourself, think about this for your neurotypical kids that are 18 plus that you've sent off to college. It's a really good idea to have these documents for, for your neurotypical 18 plus kids. And then also as you're considering this, think about the aging family members in your life. Um, is it an aunt or an uncle or is it your parents? Do you have aging parents or grandparents? Um, making sure that they have these documents in place before the crisis happens, before there's a stroke or some medical event that was unexpected, um, having these updated. Um, the thing is, is when it comes to legal documents, what I have found is a high, high percentage, like in the 90s, a uh, percentage of people um, in general either A, have zero documents, or B, they have very, very outdated documents that should have probably been updated. And we recommend having, um, you know, a professional look at your documents every three to five years. Laws change, things change, there's best practices and things like that. So we do recommend having them looked at. But I just want to remind everybody, not just you and your spouse, but um, your, your older kids and any aging family members. It's really important. And a lot of people are not having these conversations with them. So sometimes we don't find these things out until it's a day late and a dollar short and somebody's incapacitated and we don't have the documents in place. And there's nothing you can do at that point. I mean, at a point at, at the point that a person cannot sign and they don't have capacity, they don't have mental capacity and things like that, you're you're really in a pickle. All right. Yeah. So what about guardianship? So, Allison, I'm actually going to ask that you walk through this slide with me. Um, this is a I think this is a controversial topic within the special needs community. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about guardianship that you have to do it at the 18th birthday. You can do it at the 18th birthday, but you can also do it later on. Um, Sometimes if a school requires a guardianship, we might think about something that's called an educational power of attorney, but just some basic information on guardianship. It's a, it's, it's a legal proceeding. It is a lawsuit. So you have to file a pleading, which is a letter to the court stating that you believe that your son or daughter or your loved one does not have the capacity to make 
financial or medical decisions for themselves. And you'll have to send in something that's called a doctor's report, which will sub substantiate that, um, that fact. And then your child will have somebody that's called an ad litem, and that's an attorney that the court appoints to serve your child's, his or her legal interest. Um, the court investigator will come out. That is the social worker that will make sure that everything looks good and that the, the individuals applying for guardianship are um, going to take care of that person. That's called the proposed, proposed ward. Uh, I hate that term, but that's that's the that's the language and the vocabulary that's in the statute. And then you have a hearing, um, and then you would either be appointed what we call full guardianship, which is of their person and their estate, or uh, just a guardianship of the person only. Um, so it's a it's it can for some of my clients it can be a very invasive. Um, expensive legal proceeding, or for some of my clients, it will give them the peace of mind that they know that, that someone's been appointed. It's a very individualized solution, but what I try to get my clients to do is come in, let's talk at their 18th birthday, and let's see what um, the a, a doctor's letter would say about your son or daughter. So sometimes we'll get a doctor's letter just to see, well, what does the doctor think about their capacity? Um, sometimes we will, uh, maybe wait to get guardianship, um, because under the Texas, uh, uh health and safety code, there is something that's called surrogate decision-making. So if there is no medical power of attorney, um, there is law that says that a parent can help make emergency medical decisions. Um, and then there's also something that's called supportive decision-making and uh, Allison, I'm going to turn that over to you for just a minute or two on the support of decision making. Yeah, um, I, I do want to, I want to just go back to the, the decision about guardianship, because in Texas, um, I know I've heard you say this many times before, Christina, um, it's basically the least restrictive, most appropriate for the ward is the, is the wording. And um, and a lot of parents have a lot of angst about this as we're kind of, you know, I don't know. I mean, one could argue every kid at 18 needs guardianship. Yes. Yeah. Um, that, you know, and so I always like to say that you don't have to know what you need when you go to sit down with an attorney to discuss guardianship because you're going to discuss guardianship. You're also going to discuss alternatives to guardianship because that's required. And, um, and somebody like Christina is is trained to help walk through, learn more about your child, what their abilities are and inabilities are, discussion about intellectual disability, IQ scores, those things like that is all happening. So you don't have to know when you're walking in what you need and, and that is totally, totally okay. So there are a lot of states that have something called the supported decision-making agreement some states don't have it. Texas does have a supported decision making agreement. And I like, I think for me, whenever the supported decision making agreement came out, I actually kind of thought it was funny because I thought, do I really need a document to help my kid make decisions? Haven't I been doing this their whole life? You know, it's kind of the kind of the funny thing that I thought about. Um, but it really goes along nicely. It, it, it moves alongside nicely of the power of attorney, the healthcare power of attorney, some of those other documents that you were just talking about. And that is actually what I have in place, um, you know, with my kids. I am not a huge fan of a supported decision making agreement and nothing else. Um, I, you know, you can kind of say your thoughts on that. I, I'm just pretty much a fan of the power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney when it's, um, you know, alongside of that. And then you mentioned earlier the other document, because um, sometimes people are racing to guardianship or thinking about that because their child is going to stay in the public school uh, to 21 or 22, and they're afraid that the school won't talk to them anymore. And so you did mention that educational power of attorney, which I'm also a fan of. So I, you can kind of chime in on that, but I, you know, I think my opinion and what my theory was is when the kids turned 18, the kids with disabilities is let's do the re least restrictive. Let's look at the supported decision-making agreement, power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney. If I need something more later, 
then I can cross that bridge when we get to it. But guess what? I never crossed that bridge. You know, it, it worked out being fine. So when you do something more restrictive that maybe shouldn't have been done, it's sometimes hard to undo that. And I know that you've heard of cases, Christina, or seen cases where it was done for the wrong reasons and yeah. then they wanted to go back and undo it and the judge said yeah. no no yeah we had a, a a family years ago where they had guardianship for their daughter to get her out of a lease that she had signed uh, and they did get her out of the lease but then after the that problem was resolved the family wanted the guardianship to go away um and you can't do that uh, you you can remove a guardianship. It's very difficult. That process is called restoration, but you're going to have to show that something medically, cognitively has changed um, so that that person no longer requires a guardianship. The, the courts are not going to come in and offer guardianship just really as a problem solving technique. I mean, it can, but then you'll, you'll, you will be with that guardianship until uh, the individual would no longer require it or, and could be restored which in my, in my, my practice does not happen very often. Um, and I have another thing that I have actually seen that is problematic. So again, least restrictive, um, you know, most appropriate is the wording. And I've actually seen people that have zero, there's no guardianship in place. And the individual has signed a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. They absolutely do not have capacity. I mean, we're talking IQ in yeah. the 40s or the 50s. Yeah. There's no capacity. Right. And so there, that is also a, a, another big issue of not ha having guardianship when you need to. Yeah. But yeah. I think there's a myth um, that if I have guardianship of a child and my child, for instance, commits some type of terrible crime that they're going to arrest me or that I'm going down for that or something like that. Can you address that? Well, I think what the courts would look at is, did you use reasonable care to prevent that as the guardian? Um, I think that it, it's like a criminal act. I mean, if if you gave your child access to some type of firearm, then yeah, I mean, I think criminally you could be held responsible for that. But when we're thinking about, typically parents are thinking about um, financially, being financially responsive uh, or responsible for the child. You know, Texas does not have what we call a filial responsibility law, meaning if let's say the child is in some kind of debt, it's, it's not the parent's debt. Um, so typically, you are responsible as a guardian for making sure they have food, clothing, shelter. Um, those are the responsibilities of the guardian. And if the parents are doing that and if they're in charge of the money and they're using the money for the child's benefit, keeping good records, um, the courts, that's what the courts are looking for. Yeah. Okay. So two, two questions, you know, we had the housing question earlier about a first party um, trust and mm -hmm. housing. And I, we've seen how, you know, houses be held in the trust and maybe not the first party trust. Um, is there a Medicaid payback on the house? Could the house essentially go back um, to the state if it was in a first party special needs trust? If, it, if a home is in a first party supplemental needs trust, the trust terms will say that the money has to, or that trust, the house would have to go back to the state Medicaid situation. However, I have had seen a case recently where there was a home placed in a first party supplemental needs trust. Mom was a lawyer. She basically gave up her entire life to take care of the son. The home was in the first party trust and Medicaid let her keep the house. So I, I, I tell you, I tell that story not as as it's going to be um, applied widely, but I will say that I have seen a home in a first party trust be able to go to the caregiver parent. I wouldn't count on that antidote because the way that the trust document is written, it has to go back to the state of Texas. Okay, and then someone says, okay, so it's the Medicaid payback that we're talking about. And that Medicaid payback is only in a first party special needs trust. Correct. It is not, and it actually should not be. I've actually seen it written incorrectly into a third party special yeah, needs so trust. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. Um, but the Medicaid payback is the first party special needs trust. So a person says, what happens upon the death of a beneficiary? Would the property or assets go to the state or can the beneficiary set up an ongoing trust to be created? And I don't know what they mean by ongoing trust. 
Well, it's it, the Medicaid payback is going to be applicable for the first party special needs Correct. trust period, and it won't yeah. be for the third party special Correct. needs trust. Correct. So Correct. there could be another beneficiary on the third party special, like the third party special yeah. needs trust can suggest what's going to yeah. happen, right? Yeah. Well, and then the first party trust can say after the state of Texas is reimbursed, after all those claims have been addressed, then these are the beneficiaries. So yeah, absolutely. You can have a, a beneficiary listed after the state of Texas on a first party trust. So the last question before we move on is when um, would enacting a POA with a person who is incapacitated be considered fraud? What about a supported decision making agreement? I would not have anybody sign anything that did. They didn't know what they were signing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've not I, seen any attorney that would be willing to sign <laughs> off on that. I mean, no. if an attorney could lose their license over yeah, that for sure. Yeah, I don't know if it would be necessarily a I don't know if it would be a fraud claim, but um, you would not want to do that. Well, and then the other thing is, is when you have somebody that is incapacitated signed, sign any of these documents or contracts or anything like a change of beneficiary form or any of those kind of things, um, it could be proven that they were incapacitated at the time and it would be rendered no good. Like it, would, it would be considered voided. It would be as though the document didn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like we, when we talked, we we told everybody, Allison, these beneficiary designations are critical. Um, Allison had such a great point to have a list of your assets. I usually like a spreadsheet, um, so we can track the assets. We can have a column for um, is the asset going to be managed by a financial power of attorney during your lifetime? Is it going to be managed in a trust? Where does that money go at your death? Um, and as we talked about, if your child receives assets outright, it may cause a loss of eligibility for Medicaid. And so maybe the solution to that would be the use of a first party trust. In my office, I call them oops trust. Oops, something's happened. Um, we've inherited money. We've had to had too much in work proceedings. Um, and uh, they may need to use a first party trust. If you've got money in the first party trust, we encourage you to use it because of the because of the payback provision, there's no cap on the amount that can be funded into that first party trust, unlike the ABLE account. Um, and I'm actually going to pull Allison back in to talk about the ABLE account, because that's something that um, consolidated planning can assist you with. Um, one thing on your slide here, it says get written confirmation back from the financial institution. I cannot wow. reiterate that enough. Um, I have to tell you, I mean, I do this, right? And when I updated my own beneficiaries, um, about 50% of them came back incorrect, mm -hmm. um, wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they come back wrong because the title of the trust is longer than the space that they have. Yeah. To, <laughs> they don't like that. They don't like that. <laughs> to fill it in. But it's really important to look at those confirmations and make sure it's accurate and um, and send it back and forth until it is accurate. And so the ABLE account, we do have um, entire presentations, um, you know, dedicated to the ABLE account. The ABLE um, Act is under the tax code 529A for ABLE. You've heard of 529Cs for college. This is for an individual for, um, that has a disability that started prior to age 26. That age is going up to 46 in 2026. Um, so basically, it is an account that does not count against them for um, SSI and Medicaid purposes. There are certain contribution limits um, for 2024. It's the gift tax exclusion. So it changes every year. The gift tax exclusion for 2024 is 18000 If the individual with a disability is working, they can put an additional 14580 um, up to their full earnings amount. So if they're working and they only earned 5,000, they could put an additional 5,000 in. If they were working and earned 14,580, they could put that additional amount in. But we one um, clear thing, you can only have one ABLE account per individual with a disability, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, is we never ever want the ABLE account balance to go over $100,000 because if it does, then you disqualify from Medicaid and SSI. So sometimes you can ask our old friend Google, how much money can you put into an ABLE account? And you'll say, well, Allison said it could only be up to a total of $100,000. And Google will tell you, I, I, I don't know if it's up to 500 or 550 right now, the, the lifetime maximum. 
which that is true as long as you don't care that you lose Medicaid and SSI when they're mm -hmm. one penny mm -hmm. over 100,000. So it's mm -hmm. important to know that. Um, we help people set these up all the time and you can check out our Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel for more information on the ABLE account. Um, so the key thing, some people will say, um, why should I have an ABLE account and a special needs trust? They work beautifully together. You can pay for food and shelter out of an ABLE account without a one-third reduction to SSI. And what we heard from Christina is, yes, you can pay for food and shelter out of a special needs trust, but there is a one-third reduction to SSI. So these accounts work nicely together. You can have an unlimited amount of money in a special needs trust. There's no limits of how much you put in each year or no limits of how much money could be in the trust. And there is a limited amount of money that you can put into an ABLE account each year and a limited amount that it can grow to before you would disqualify. So that is why you want to have both of these vehicles. Um, how are we on questions? Um, I think there's one in the chat box. Okay. So uh, did you talk more about checking beneficiaries? I checked online. It looks correct, but that's not in writing. Should you print it from the website? I mean, if it was me, I'm a paper person. Yes, I would print it from the website and I'd probably scan it into my computer and I would have my financial advisor and my attorney take a look at it too. Um, also, you can most of these insurance companies now you can email them. They have a portal where you can email them and you can say, you know, could you please send me in writing my beneficiary designations for yeah. all of the following policies and then they will send you an official thing in writing as opposed to a print screen mm -hmm. and i'm a little extra i would probably do that because i've seen so many times where these insurance companies get them wrong yeah. and you're also going to want to ask for your primary beneficiaries and your contingent so your primary beneficiaries if you die who gets the money but if you die and your primary beneficiary is already dead and gone, then who does the money go to? That's your contingent beneficiaries. A lot of times people never even name a contingent beneficiary, but you might want to ask about that. I think the, the probability of people dying at the same time is not that high. Um, I've seen it very little in my, you know, my entire career, but I guess you just, I mean, you never know. So that's the point of having the contingent. And also the point is um, people forgetting to change their beneficiaries after somebody dies, um, that could be another issue as well. So let's talk about the important estate planning decisions. So who the trustee is, is one of the topics we spend a lot of time at my office. And that's the person that's in charge of the money. Um, it's not a position of honor. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of um, organizational skills. So I say it's really the three T's. They have to have time, talent, and be trustworthy. So that may not be a sibling. You know, siblings as trustees or a family member can complicate the um, relationship between the child with a disability and their sibling who's in charge of the money. Um, some other things that we think about is how to divide the estate. Um, and does the child with a disability get more or less? And this is gonna be a very personal conversation um, you can work with consolidated planning and they can help you figure out ways that you can fund these trusts for a plan that works for your particular family. Um, there's also something that's called a letter of intent. It's letter of instructions that could be both medically and financially to the trustee. Uh, consolidated planning has a great webinar on this topic that they discuss um, uh, in, in some detail. If you've appoint somebody, whether it's a financial or a medical power of attorney or a trustee or an executor, please make sure that they know that they're appointed. Um, we have a lot of family members and friends that come into our office. They had no idea they were appointed their um, sister's executor. Uh, something happens and all of a sudden there's a lot of responsibility that they didn't know about. Um, if you've appointed people, I think you should at least tell them they're appointed at a very minimum. Uh, you want to take it one step further, maybe show them the document and, or show them that Excel spreadsheet where all the assets are, go over the beneficiary designations. That really is the best practice because if you're going to expect something from somebody else, give them the tools that they need to do a great job. Um, again, check those beneficiary designations and update your um, documents or review them at least once a year. You don't have to go see an attorney necessarily, but pull them out. Um, make sure you know where they are. Uh, make sure you still like the people that you're um, 
uh, have named that you're still married to them, that they haven't had some type of health issue. Um, and make sure that you have all the documents that you think you have, or you thought you had a financial power of attorney, but you can't locate it. You know, actually visually take a look at it and make sure that it's there and that it says everything that you want it to say. And I would say also be um, cognizant of appointing um, people much older than you. When you're young, you know, if you're in your 20s and your 30s, it's really, um, you know, reasonable if you were going to make a trustee your your father or something like that. But people age over time. So a person that is 85 may not have the same ability to do the things that they did when they were 55 so keeping that in mind um as well it's it's not a small task like you said christina it is it is a big deal um well christina um you have gone over a lot of great information with us today and i'm so glad that you came back with us oh, thank um, you, Mom. i know that you're in the houston area and that you are accepting new clients and i know that you guys um offer um, consultations. And what I love about your consultations is while you guys do charge for consultations, you guys are really prepared. When you come yeah. into that initial meeting, <laughs> it's not just a like, hey, yeah. hey, what's your name kind of meeting. This is, this is the real deal. Yeah. And so um, if you, when it comes to working with a professional, we want you to work with a professional that's nuanced and special needs. Reach out to uh, the law office of Christina Lesher. She can definitely help you uh, again on these things on your legal documents or um, the the discussion of um, guardianship or alternatives to guardianship. They can definitely help you with that. So um, we always um, end with the things to keep on your radar. Again, we're going to send um, our slides to everyone. Um, it's just so, so critically important and um, it, it is a long list. It is daunting when it comes to planning for a loved one with a disability, but we have um, webinars on every one of these topics, ABLE accounts, SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, Medicare, the, the Medicaid waivers. Um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the special needs trust. We've taken deep, deeper dives on those. Um, we've had lots of housing webinars of, you know, um, you know, who's going to care for my child when I'm gone. We've done a lot of webinars on post high school education options. So if you're thinking of transition, um, there's a lot of options out there for our kids with disabilities. So don't hang it up as there's nothing because there is a lot and there's a lot across Texas. There's a lot all across the United States. Um, so you'll get a link to our upcoming webinars that you can register for. We work on a collaborative team here at CPG. I always like people to have um, names and faces, that, uh, not just be me. I know you guys hear from Michelle a lot. She does a lot of our webinars as well. And um, we always offer free personalized consultations. So if you have additional questions, things that maybe you didn't put in the a chat box, Maybe you've done a lot of planning and you need a second opinion or a look under the hood. You want to make sure things are right. We're happy to help with that. Um, maybe you would say, I'm embarrassed because I haven't done what I need to do and I need help. And I always say it's not about looking back. It's about looking forward and taking those um, next steps. So whether you've done a lot of planning, a little planning, or you just don't even know where to get started, we can definitely help you. And this QR code will take you to a calendar where you can book a free initial consultation. So it's certainly been my pleasure uh, being back with you, Christina, and we'll look Thanks forward so to partnering with you again. You're always so much great information. Oh. So, and thank you everyone for your questions today. Great questions. And I think, you know, I feel like we're, you know, we are a community We're we're together and we're bonded by a loved one with a disability. Mm -hmm. And I, I call it the relentless pursuit of information. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm always growing and always trying to learn more and, you know, how to close the gap and how can we navigate these things more effectively and the questions that people ask um, and I, I feel like it helps everyone. So I certainly appreciate it. Yeah. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Christina. Thank you. Bye now.